everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching World War I, The Seminal Tragedy, Episode 3, The July Crisis by Extra History. Last time, we saw the death that kicked off this whole conflict, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, but we still have a bit to go before war kicks off, a lot of decisions to be made, a lot of miscommunication. I imagine we'll see some of that in this episode. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this one, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon. It is linked down below, and it will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. The 5th of July, 1914. The Archduke and Duchess are dead. Gavrilo Princep is in jail, but catastrophe is not yet certain. Act two. Yeah, and I like the metaphor they showed there. The match has been lit. It hasn't quite hit the oil drum yet. So this was the spark that set this conflict off, but the spark hasn't ignited everything else yet. Like I said in the introduction, sure, this assassination is the event that leads up to the war most directly, but, well, first of all, there are a lot of other causes, far more complex than just one assassination, and two, we are not quite at the beginning of the war yet. We have a bit to go. Negotiations, miscommunication, you know, we have a process to go through before everything actually erupts into conflict. Who begins? We open on an Austrian delegation arriving in Potsdam. It is now a week after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. The Austrians want to take action. They want war with the Serbs, who they think are behind the group of ragged young men that actually pulled the trigger. But before they can have their war, they decide they must- Yeah, and Serbia absolutely had some involvement in their group, the Black Hand. We know that is undeniable. Now, specifically, how much influence did Serbia, the Serbian government, or Serbian officials have in this particular assassination? Of course, it's unclear. Everything like this is always unclear. But there's some sort of involvement there, and so Austria, of course, is furious, and they want to punish Serbia. Consult with their much stronger ally, the German Empire. So they send a delegation to Potsdam to meet with the Kaiser, Wilhelm II. They've been restrained before by Germany, held back from acting in the Balkans, so they need to know what Germany plans to do. They go to the Kaiser and tell him that this is intolerable, that they cannot abide such a humiliation, that they cannot let this act of terrorism go unpunished. And the Kaiser says to them, We'll back you whatever you do. Just act and act quickly. Germany is behind you, without reservation. The Kaiser thinks that general war can be avoided, that if the Austrians strike while all of Europe is enraged over this assassination, if they act while the brutal slaughter of the Archduke and Duchess is still fresh in people's minds, no one will raise a finger to defend Serbia. Yeah, because this act, this assassination, led to popular outcry throughout Europe. Uh, a lot of people saw it as unjustifiable, and you can imagine why. It was seen as a murder in cold blood to many people. Now, maybe some radicals, uh, including the assassins amongst them, felt that it was justified, it contributed to their cause, but that is not how most people saw it. And so Austria taking some sort of action, well, either people might see it as justifiable, or maybe they'd just leave it. You know, well, maybe Austria's going too far, but, well, look who started it. You know, people often have that sort of attitude. Uh, but even with this first step, we already start seeing some of the issues that will lead to this conflict spiraling out of control. Austria first goes to Germany. Now, at this point in history, once upon a time, Austria was the big brother of the relationship. But since Prussia unified Germany, we now have this, you know, big and powerful German empire. Now Germany's the big brother to Austria. <laughs> and Germany says, well, Wilhelm says, and we've talked about how he's sort of brash, acts without thinking, all of that, feels the need to prove himself. He says, you know what? You've got our go-ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll sign off on whatever you want to do. We will back you. And then we're going to see something similar from the opposite side of this engagement. So allies start being brought in. Powerful, great power allies. And everything continues to expand and expand and expand until it's truly out of control. And even if, even if the Russian Empire decided that they wanted to protect their Serbian allies, if the Austrians can strike quickly- Even if? No, that wouldn't happen, would it? Hmm, I guess we'll see. <laughs> it'll be a fait accompli. The war will be over before the Russians can mobilize their forces. This is what he thinks as he tells the Austrian delegation that they have a blank check, that Germany will back them whatever they do. And yes, then, that's yeah. the idea, right? That this act has been committed, 
Austria feels that Serbia is involved and Serbia must be punished, and so they're going to act quickly, decisively, keep this conflict small, contained to the Balkans. Even if Russia wanted to defend Serbia, protect them, they won't have the time. It'll all happen too quick. That is sort of the initial broad plan. He goes on vacation, on a boat, for three weeks yep. where he can't be reached. Yep. <laughs> so the Austrians come home, German assurances in hand, but in Austria there's disagreement. The Hungarian part of their empire initially objects to war. They hope that a peaceful solution might be found, but their voices alone. Where were the other voices of reason, or the other arguments for peace? Dead on the streets of Sarajevo. Mm. The Archduke was perhaps the greatest defender of the Serbs in the empire. Yeah, they brought this up. I don't know if he was the greatest defender of Serbs, but... I remember I brought up last time that the Archduke was more a voice for moderation and would actually speak up for some of these ethnic minorities within the empire, uh, as opposed to a lot of the other more conservative voices of the court. And so there's a, a bit of sick irony in the fact that it is his death that leads up to all of this. And so when moderation was called for, the parties for war simply had to point to his death and say, he was their greatest friend, look what they did to him, yeah. what do you think they're going to do to us? And all arguments were quelled. So at last, the Hungarians relented on one condition, a condition that'll be important later, that the Austro-Hungarian Empire would not annex a foot of Serbian land. And with that, the Austrians began drafting an ultimatum to Serbia. But this ultimatum is delayed by a chance for peace. Two men, rivals in the heart of Serbia, in Belgrade, the very capital in the center of this crisis, hmm. are two of the only men far-sighted enough to see the clouds gathering on the edge of Europe. They are the ambassador from Austria and the ambassador from Russia to Serbia. They both have come to the same conclusion about where this storm will end, so they plan to put aside their differences and meet to perhaps work out a plan for peace. On the 10th of July, the Russian ambassador arrives at the house of the ambassador from Austria-Hungary. The details are agreed to, the plan is set, all that's left is one final meeting to perhaps smooth out tensions, to avert world war. Hey, they talk, there you go. They take cigarettes, both sides are open, things are going well, and then wham, the Russian ambassador falls dead of a heart attack. <laughs> Nothing signed, no war stopped. Jesus, talk about unfortunate. That is about the worst luck you could possibly have in that circumstance. And what we're going to see, and, and this is one of the things that's truly remarkable about World War I, just like the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, we talked about last time how so many things had to go a particular way to build up to this assassination. World War I is kind of similar. I mean, first of all, that assassination had to happen in that way. And then when we talk about, you know, the direct buildup, the negotiations, the planning before the war, there are so many of these events. I mean, you know, we're talking about Europe in the 20th century. There are a lot of different lines of communication. Uh, you know, diplomacy is very complicated. There's all this stuff going on. It's a very complicated picture, actually. And so there were so many things that have to go a particular way. So many people making the wrong decisions, so many miscommunications, so many messages not reaching the right person, all that sort of stuff that has to go one particular way for this war to actually kick off. Now, we've talked about in this series, I am a believer that a lot of the trends of the era, the nationalism, the militarism, the political tensions, were building towards some sort of conflict. But if we look at this war in particular... A lot of things had to go a particular way to get us there, and I think we're already, there's a good example of that, we'll probably see more of that in this, in the next episode. The Serbians blame the Austrians. Rumors circulate that they had the Russian ambassador assassinated, that the Austrian ambassador killed him in his own house. Worse still, this leaves the Russians without an ambassador in Serbia. As events begin to accelerate toward war, they have no diplomatic channel at the Ooh. center of everything, no lines of communication, no eyes or ears on the ground. They have nobody with the experience, connections, or familiarity with Serbia that the former ambassador had to send- Yeah, like I said, diplomacy is- and it has been, but it is very complicated, right? And, well, I talked about how we're dealing with sort of 20th century Europe with all these different lines of communication. Of course, they are also faster <laughs> lines of communication than previously, but, you know, a lot of the diplomatic core- is still a little bit anachronistic in how it works. A lot of it is still based on those personal connections. And to a certain extent, diplomacy is still based on personal connections today. And so to lose such an important figure, yeah, that is a big, big loss heading towards a war of such importance. 
and out. And even if they did, it'd take weeks to get them appointed and shipped from Moscow to Sarajevo. Weeks they don't have. But with this last overture turning to catastrophe, the Austrians decide it's finally time to send their ultimatum. But they can't. Again, they delay. You see, President Poincaré, the leader of France, is going to Russia to meet with the Tsar, and the Austrians, ever nervous, decide that they can't send the ultimatum while their two greatest adversaries are meeting together in the same place. Mm -hmm. It would never do. They could make decisions too quickly. They could coordinate in ways they normally couldn't when they're a thousand miles apart. So the Austrians delay. They wait until Poincaré is a hundred miles out to sea. And so, you know, each individual step, you're like, okay, so that's why this delay happened, and that's why this delay happened, and etc., etc. But each delay moves them further away from their original plan. Remember, their original plan is to get in there and punish Serbia quickly, because they know Serbia will not accept the ultimatum being sent their way, right? So the idea is that they got to get in there, finish this quickly. People, you know, there won't be too much of an international outcry and the Russians won't have time to mobilize. But now it's taking longer and longer and longer to respond. Other countries have time to prepare. The assassination, the inciting event, is fading from people's memories. It's becoming less and less present in the minds of the people of Europe. And so things are already moving away from the original idea. For sending their ultimatum. But at last, on the 23rd of July, an ultimatum is sent. From the Austrians to the Serbs. The Serbs have 48 hours to agree to all points or face war. Yeah. The ultimatum asks many things, but most of all, it asks that Austrian police be granted free reign to investigate the assassination on Serbian soil. This is impossible. Yeah, and that especially is not going to happen. I mean, it is a direct violation of Serbia's sovereignty, something which, as a country that for a long time was under the domination of foreign powers, you can imagine it is very protective over. So it is not going to let Austria violate its sovereignty like that. But, you know, some of the other parts of the ultimatum are more debatable, more acceptable. The thing as a whole, no. To agree to such a thing is tantamount to giving up sovereignty. Yeah. No nation would accept this. But that's all right, because the ultimatum is only a ruse anyway. A cover for what the Austrians really want. Yeah, exactly. The Austrians want war. They want the ultimatum to be rejected, because they want to appear to the world as though they <laughs> gave the Serbs a chance to avoid a conflict. They want to appear blame-free for the invasion they're planning. Yeah, it's basically a piece of political propaganda, right? The ultimatum. And this is exactly right. All it's supposed to do is make Austria look like they gave Serbia a chance. So that when Austria invades, it still appears justifiable. This ultimatum is not actually meant to be accepted. Planning. And here is where things begin to speed up. Europe begins to boil. Up until this point, the crisis in the Balkans is just another event on the world stage. But all of a sudden, with the release of this ultimatum, people start to clue in to what's happening. Mm. Powers outside of Austria, Germany, and Serbia begin to pay attention. But for us, we're going to turn our attention to one man. Sergei Sazanov. Okay. Sergei Sazanov was the foreign minister of Russia. And for him, the 24th of July is about to be a very, very busy day. In the morning, he wakes to receive the terms of the ultimatum that Austria sent to Serbia. He reads quietly to himself, and then turns to an aide and fatefully utters, it's a European war. A cabinet meeting- And as you can see, a lot of people at this time, you know, at the very time all of this was happening, realized what the outcome would be. You know, I feel like sometimes, and like I said, a lot of things needed to go a particular way for this war to happen. Sometimes it's sort of framed as this accidental thing where people didn't really know what they were getting into. And in some ways that is true, like it does rely on a lot of miscommunication. But in other ways, people saw where this was going and some people tried to stop it. So there were people at the time who saw how bad this could get. A lot of people didn't, but some did. Thing is hastily assembled. The highest levels of the Russian government are all- Or they maybe didn't understand how bad it could get. That's an over-exaggeration. But they understood that it would not be some quick contained conflict. I'll put it that way. Well, there. They resolved to ask the Austrians to give the Serbs more time, while at the same time pushing the Serbs not to resist the Austrians. They also make the fateful decision to begin a partial mobilization mm -hmm. of their forces along the Austrian border, trying to play all the angles at once in the schizophrenic chaos that seemed all too common in the days just before the war. Now it's noon. Sazanov takes lunch with the French and, and British- so did you hear that? Uh, the Russians are already preparing a partial mobilization around Austria's borders. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
I thought the idea that was that uh, this whole thing would kick off before Russia had a chance to prepare. Now, the idea is that it's going to take Russia a long time to prepare. That idea actually ends up being a bit faulty. But they're already moving in that direction, so things are already sort of slipping away from Austria. The ambassador. The French ambassador reiterates France's complete support. The British ambassador says that Britain sympathizes, but that he can't make any commitments. Now it's afternoon. <laughs> the Russian ministers reconvene. With Sazanov confirming the unwavering support of the French, they decide to fully back Serbia, even to the point of war. Yep. And now it's evening. Sazanov meets with Portales, the ambassador from Germany. Portales begs Sazanov to call off Russian mobilization. He tells him that there must be solidarity between the monarchies, that they must work together or all fall alone. Hmm. The argument gets heated. Portales tells Sazanov there will be revolution. Revolution in Europe if the monarchies do not work together. Yeah, and he's drawing back to a, at this point, 100-year history that we already talked about earlier in this series. You know, this whole concert of Europe, as we call it, this diplomatic system that was set up following the Napoleonic Wars, uh, primarily by the hands of Clemens von Metternich, but a lot of these diplomats coming together, the idea was that the conservative reactionary monarchies of Europe would work together to avoid war and avoid revolution, because oftentimes one can lead to the other. And so when he says that, he is drawing on this long history. You know, we have to work together. We cannot afford to go to war you know, this might cause revolution, rebellion, all of these things that we saw in France during the French Revolution. And of course, a lot of that we saw spread under Napoleon. So th these are interesting points he's making that draw back to basically the last hundred years of European history. If they don't work together, all the crowns will fall. And he's right. Within five years, all the great monarchies of huh. Europe, true monarchies, monarchies yeah. where the monarch was the head of state, would... And they said true monarchies because, of course, the British monarchy didn't fall. But what they're implying is that the British monarchy had lost a lot of its power. And so the point they're making is fairly apt. A lot of these great empires with powerful monarchs at the top, yeah, they would collapse during this conflict. Collapse. Within five years, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the German Empire would be no more. Yeah. Their kings dispossessed, thousands of years of monarchical tradition burnt away in the fires of cataclysmic war. Yeah. Then something tragic happens. It's one of those small tragedies that lines the path to the First World War. Those things that tear you up as you read about these events with perfect hindsight. Mm. It's one of those moments that almost makes this seem like a script. <laughs> like a high drama constructed for the stage. Until you realize how real it is. Yeah. Real enough to... No, it, it really does appear that way sometimes. A high drama, but a high drama that leads to millions of fatalities. A high drama with extremely serious consequences uh, and tragic consequences right if out a generation for you see sazanov utters the words if austria hungary swallows serbia we will go to war did you catch it if not that's all right neither mm -hmm. did portales poor portales who so desperately wants to avoid war you see russia's main concern was that austria would annex serbia if the austrians planned to conquer serbia then it had to be war but remember earlier when the austro-hungarians were arguing among themselves about the ultimatum that hungarian element wouldn't lend its voice to war unless the other members of the austro-hungarian empire agreed that they would not annex a foot of serbian soil well nobody told portales he was the german ambassador not the austrian ambassador and somehow the memo never got to him that the austrians yep. had no plans to actually take over serbia well and once again we talk about how this war or the build-up to the war begins to expand because allies are brought in these great powers are now negotiating on behalf of their sort of weaker allies you have germany and russia basically negotiating on behalf of um, austria and serbia and so things get lost in that sort of web of communication. So in their whole discussion, he never gets to communicate this to Sazanov. This may be one of the last moments where the world could have avoided this war. Portales impassioned, begging for peace. Sazanov firmly stating the Russian case. The two diplomats meeting in the quiet St. Petersburg night. I, was, I hope next time we uh, get to talk about the series... Uh, the communication between the Tsar and the Kaiser, who were related at this time, because... That is truly fascinating. Um, I reckon they'll bring it up next time, and if they don't, I will, So, but I'll save it. But that's interesting stuff. But the world hinges on small things, and in that gentle night, one of the last the world would know for years, the opportunity is missed. The hands of fate tighten around the neck of Europe. Hmm. 
The next day, the Austrians reject demands that they extend the deadline, the Kaiser at last decides to return to Germany, and two minutes before the ultimatum expires, the Serbians send Austria their reply. But that's a story for next time. Ooh. We'll see you then. Alrighty. Story for next time. Oh man. It's getting bad. <laughs> we are really building up. Um, I've enjoyed this series so far. I will say, I mean, you know, we're talking about four videos, each around or less than 10 minutes long, about the build-up to World War One. You know, you could, and I believe people have, taught entire college courses on this. Uh, they're leaving a lot out in order to construct the narrative they're showing to us. Now, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Just keep it in mind. I think the narrative they're showing is one that I largely agree with about this sort of tragic build-up to the war, but it is a narrative, and a lot is being left out, a lot of the information, and uh, I mean, I'm not the best person to go to about that. This is not my area of expertise. <laughs> like I said, there are college courses about this. There are many professors and books you can rely on to give you that information better, um, but I am enjoying this, and I do think they're doing a pretty good job in presenting this story. Because that is sort of how it's being presented, and I mean, in some ways, that's what it is. A very compelling story that has some very tragic consequences. So, um, last time we saw the assassination of the Archduke. Today, we are building up to the point of no return. Next episode, I imagine we will cross that point of no return and actually slide into the war. We've got some interesting stuff to talk about next time. Uh, so, I hope you guys stay tuned. If you enjoyed this one, leave a like, subscribe all that good stuff. Now, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.